it'll be awesome. I know. Nothing brightens a dark room like light from a window. Time to open the window! Oh, no! Okay, I know some of you are tired of me constantly ragging on my first Owl House video, but it really is terrible. I didn't cave into whatever mob or agenda you suggest is corrupting comedy, and as long as people keep parading it around as some sort of holy text for negative thoughts on the show, I will be here to proudly oppose it with... Fuck. Yes. Also, if outraged channels develop the cryptocurrency at this point, I think they could control the bloody planet. There hasn't been a cartoon in recent years that's gripped me quite the way the Owl House has. Despite having more reserved thoughts on season 1 than most people, I always saw it as a solid and entertaining show with a ton of untapped potential to do great things with its story and characters, but was held back by a multitude of pacing problems, storytelling cliches, a few world building contrivances, stuff like that. Overall, I'd still give Owl House season 1 a 6 out of 10, but I still enjoyed watching it for the most part. Then the first half of season 2 came around and if season 1 was baby's first 6 out of 10, season 2A was like a gratifying 8. It impressed me so much with its mature themes, dedication to moving its plot forward with little distractions, and the development of its previously uneven cast promising big things to come. It took all of my fears of what the show could become if it went down the wrong path and did the best it could to avoid any of those possible outcomes. While not perfect, season 2A was an engaging, entertaining, surprisingly emotional and well-developed set of episodes, and things were looking to get even better. And now we're at the end of season 2. The second half of season 2 has had my jaw on the floor of how much the show has improved since its first season. The characters are fully realised and fleshed out, the story is getting much darker and more engaging, throwing around so many ideas and juggling them all effortlessly, managing to keep that story on track despite its fast pacing and unfair treatment from Disney, and has managed to build a sense of tension and excitement for every episode that I haven't felt with a show in years and also set a record for the number of traumatized children in a kid's show. Can someone hug Hunter, please? Dude saw his only father figure get splattered into a Jackson Pollock painting by the spawn of space itself. I play it every day! I play it every hour! <laughs> The Owl House Season 2 is a testament to the skill of its writers. Despite seemingly rushing through the story after having its third season unfairly cut short, adding to the growing list of reasons for why Disney should burn to the ground, it hasn't left any of its episodes and ideas half done, managing to contain itself within a solid 22 minutes consistently without overwhelming people. In fact, if anything, forcing the show to work on its story after Season 1 already laid the groundwork has actually been to the benefit in the sort of twisted irony. In all Disney's efforts to basically kneecap the show, it's instead resulted in the fastest boost in quality I've ever seen. I'm not gonna act like the show is perfect or even a masterpiece. Issues still arise that are hard to ignore, but I feel confident in saying that the Owl House is incredible now, and it deserves to stand tall and equal with some of the best story-driven cartoons of the last 10 years. In this video, I'm going to cover the entirety of Season 2B and what it does right, while briefly mentioning the flaws to keep this review as well-rounded and unbiased as possible. Although, yes, I will absolutely be gushing and I'm going to become insufferable when Season 3 comes out, because cartoon finales are awesome, except you know any of these. Before we go anywhere near the new episodes, though, it's crucial we go over some important bits of context surrounding the season, and having a brief look at the older episodes as well as giving me an excuse to show some appreciation for things I haven't mentioned before and to let me correct myself on some stuff. Okay, so where to start? Uh, oh yeah, um, <clears throat> Matthew Reese is a fucking liar! That wasn't very nice, I'm sorry, but what in the lord of- misunderstood? Misunderstand these hands, motherfucker! I made a few comments in my first review of season 2 that in hindsight have not aged gracefully thanks to this one little tidbit. I seem to recall proposing the idea that there was a side of Bellows that cared for Hunter in some form or fashion, and that while he was obviously manipulative, he was a lot more caring than he let on. But then a hollow mind just showed up, kicked down the door, and now I just look like a fucking tit! It's such a jump, he went from a potentially misunderstood antagonist all the way to Wizard Hitler in one episode. With that out of the way, Bellos is a scary and very well written manipulator. He's come a long way from being the butt of obvious Undertale jokes, to being a legitimately intimidating threat that makes you feel uncomfortable with how he manipulates others. And re-watching the series after Hollow Mind makes these previous scenes far more brilliant than they were back then, due to the obvious, vague statements of glue-huffing fuck. In fact, I gained a bit more appreciation 
for a few things in 2A when looking back, specifically episode 4. I dug into this episode because I found it to be pretty unfunny and fillery. I never really mentioned the reason why people tend to praise the episode though, and looking back on it for this review, I appreciate what it tried to do. It's sort of meant to represent the disabled child's perspective of growing up with a parent that doesn't listen to them. The whole episode is supposed to be an allegory for that exact concept, and in all honesty, I appreciate the effort. It's not like I couldn't relate to it myself, while not exactly disabled, I did grow up autistic and around some people who wouldn't listen to me, but the actual writing of the episode leaves a lot to be desired, and I still don't think it's very entertaining. The allegory is really all the episode seems to have going for us, and if it resonated with you, then, well, more power to you. Personally though, it contained a lot of the undesirable aspects of the show that were present in Season 1, and I still think the idea I proposed in my first video in Season 2 would have been more compelling. I've also really warmed up to Lilith looking back. I've always maintained the stance that the way she was redeemed was rushed, but that Season 2 at least managed to make her likeable. One thing you should probably know about me is that I am a complete idiot. Looking back through Season 1, it's clear that Lilith was another victim of Belleth's manipulation, essentially from birth. Her mindset of being the best of the best and joining the Emperor's Coven being thrusted upon her from a young age, being forced to fight her sister, Ida, for a position which led to her cursing Ida. I think I tended to gloss over how Lilith never intended on cursing her sister and was tricked into thinking the potion would remove her magic for a day, and that certainly influenced my own bias against her character. She never wanted any of this, and it's why throughout Season 1, instead of simply capturing Ida, she's always trying to strike a middle ground where Ida joins the Emperor's Coven to fulfill their dreams as kids, with Bellows promising to cure her. It's why she plays along with Ida's games, still holds respect for her, and isn't forced to take things seriously until Bellows threatens her position. Her character turnaround comes quick because everything she's done has ultimately been for Ida's sake. And I have no idea how I didn't pick up on that. I sincerely apologize, although in my defense... Then why were you so easy to curse? Like... Come on. Season 1's writing frustrates me sometimes. Other things I appreciate looking back include Hunter's entire character arc and his own feelings of worth, belonging, and acceptance, making him the best character on the show. Uh... Ida's Requiem is still the best episode. Alright, let's, let's, let's just address the elephant in the room now. You little rat! It's no secret that Owl House has had a bit of a troubled production going on. <laughs> this is impressively bad. Especially right now, due to the obvious. Oh, no! Look, as much as you can try and explain why the show got canned, none of it makes a ton of sense. Disney brand, huh? Alright, Bobby. Hey, let's check in on Amphibia. <laughs> Ah, but, well, I, I see. Remember kids, child murder is for everyone. Is certainly an American statement. And I mean, you can really feel the spite of the Owl House crew in the new episodes. I mean, pulling out the entire animation budget for an on-screen gay kiss? Damn, I wish I was able to spite Disney that much. Wouldn't you rather, uh, I don't know, have a beach day? Maybe if we had time for 20 more adventures, but we don't. You must be so proud of yourselves. <laughs> Well, you shouldn't be. There's a lot of reasons to be concerned about season 3 being drastically shortened into a bunch of specials as opposed to a full season. It's barely enough time to wrap up a story of this scale that they finally managed to flesh out and make their own. And after a string of finale disappointments in recent years, it's perfectly valid to be worried about the how this may turn out. Because if this community has learned anything over the years, lack of time plus finale equals... This might not end well. However, a quick counterpoint. While it's clear that Owl House is not going to wrap up its story in a way that will satisfy everyone, or in a way that the team themselves deem the best outcome, I have to remind you that these three specials are 44 minutes each. You put that together, and that's about the average length for a feature-length film. So you hear Owl House has three more episodes, and obviously you're like, WHAT IN THE BUGGERING FUCK? But what if I instead told you, Owl House, the movie? Now it's more like, well, okay, Toonji, go on. Owl House could rush every idea it had for season 3 out in this time frame, becoming yet another victim of Disney's poor decision making, while also not making the wisest choices with their time. Or, Owl House gets over two hours of runtime to conclude the current story arc, the arcs of its characters, and resolving its massive cliffhanger ending. Over two hours can actually be a perfectly reasonable amount of time to resolve this story. It may not be the grandest series finale of all time, considering how much potential the show had to go beyond its third season, but if it can at least bring a satisfying and cohesive ending to its current story predicament and leaving the show on a solid note, that just might be enough. Also, when you think about it, and this is yet again me cock-riding Gravity Falls, okay, buckle 
level up, Weird Mageddon, when all the parts are put together, is about an hour and a half. Gravity Falls had an hour and a half to wrap up its story after Dipper and Mabel vs. the Future left it on a massive cliffhanger, where everything seemed to go wrong for the characters. And we all know how well Weird Mageddon concluded Gravity Falls. I get it's not quite the same scenario, seeing as Gravity Falls was ended by its creator rather than Disney smiting the show down like a boulder as they did with Owl House, but I have honest faith with how Season 2 set up and executed its story, aware of its time limit, that Season 3 can pull off an ending rather well. Even still, Owl House is the kind of show that needs more seasons. It has so many amazing ideas and pieces of background lore that can be explored, and I really want to see how all of that plays out. This isn't a Gravity Falls situation where this stuff isn't all too important and the show can willingly end without going into detail, leaving these things up for interpretation of theories. This is a show having the rug pulled out from under it when at the top of its game. I'd love for the show to get the ending it deserves or to have even more seasons to go in depth on its many interesting ideas, but so long as it concludes what it's currently doing with Grace, I'll be satisfied. So now, without further ado, let's delve into the new episodes and show exactly why the Owl House is incredible now. Episode 11 picks up from the- ah, 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 ah. Episode 11 picks up from the heartbreaking ending of episode 10, which saw Lou's promise to her mom to come back home, refusing to tell the truth of what happened to her friends, more specifically Amity, considering what happened, while creating a plan to save Rain during the Coven Day Parade, as they are seemingly buddy-buddy of the Emperor's Coven again despite being captured for portraying the Emperor in Edith's Requiem. This episode mainly serves as a place to put down all of the ideas for the rest of the season and, quite literally, take it one day at a time. It's all about setup, but it still manages to be entertaining and overall rather meaningful. Kiki Mora, I finally remembered her name, evidently has stuff going on in the background of her own family, struggling to choose between family matters and serving the Emperor. <laughs> I'm going to cry, especially when Kikimura has failed the Emperor so many times this season, and this all happens at the right time for Luz. Seeing Kiki's plight is a way for her to give herself some form of self-therapy over what happened between her and her mom, tying Kiki into the Coven Day plan so that she can mend her family issues. Luz is clearly not coping well with the trauma of that situation, so any chance she gets to merely project those feelings or is able to make herself feel better through helping someone who's going through a similar situation, she is going to take it. As for Kiki herself, I appreciate that they gave her some more background, an actual character outside of being a psychotic footstool. Hunter really did drive that small man syndrome out in full force, and I also like that she was easily manipulated. That doesn't sound right, let me start that again. I appreciate that she didn't immediately become a good guy for this episode and fell victim once again to the Emperor's manipulation, through the words of Terra. She was completely on board with escaping all of the pain and going along with Luz's plan, but the second she's offered a promotion, it's enough to bring out her power-hungry side once more, further demonstrating how much of a grasp the Emperor has on her and by extension, the rest of the Emperor's Coven. Aside from that, I'm glad I'm not the only one who caught how different Luz's memory of what happened between her mom was compared to what actually happened. When you come home, promise you'll stay here. I didn't mean to push you away. I swear things will be different. Promise me. When you come home, you'll stay with me, and you'll never go back to that place. While it was technically what her mom was saying in a panic, it misses all of the nuance of what she was saying and boils it all down to, don't ever go to that place again, never leave me again. While at first glance it may just be a way for them to shortly display that scene for a flashback, it just fits too well with Luz's unwillingness to leave the boiling aisles, while also missing her mom. I definitely think Luz misremembering this incident or interpreting it this way is intentional, especially because the line, Mom, it's not you, it never doesn't fit with what Camila says in the flashback, but fits perfectly in the original scene. That's an incredibly creative way to write this scene, and a very subtle way to write around the idea of remembering things differently. Luz is so used to her mom disapproving of her love for fantasy, weirdness, and not fitting in, that the moment her mom pours her heart out, she simply interprets it as her mom's disapproval. It would also strengthen why the episode begins with Luz trying to record a message for her mom, showing off how the Boiling Isles really isn't this dangerous place, trying to attribute social structures that are familiar in the human realm to it, even showing off her school, but always facing the fact that this place isn't safe, it's not the same as the human realm. It's a wild fantasy that Luz knows her mother wouldn't approve of. It makes sense why she would record this for her if this was her takeaway from what happened. Along with this, Ida confronting Rain was tough, considering what happened in Ida's Requiem. And even though we know now that Rain isn't under any sort of influence and is just acting the part, I like that they never went full evil and was still the same sort of person as they were while going against the Emperor, just clearly a lot more serious and having the Emperor's idea 
ideals in mind. Amity testing the waters with Willow was a really nice scene. I love that they're showing us how that bond is being mended and Amity's hesitance to overstep any boundaries with Willow. I've seen a lot of complaints from people about how Amity has just lost any sense of individuality and it's just loser's girlfriend now. I don't know why that's a conclusion people are drawing when it's just evidently not true. Sure, she's tied to lose a lot, but she's still a character with her own concerns, morals, and struggles. Just because they may be tied to lose as well doesn't change the fact that they're still her own feelings. She's not the piece of cardboard that people are saying she is. I think this may have to do with her no longer needing to go under a full season-long character arc like she did in season 1. But she still has her own arcs in season 2 and it's a much stronger character than she was before. Hell, even in this episode, she knows that she can find out if Luz is lying to her about the portal and meeting Camila if she watches the video Luz recorded, but is torn between getting answers or respecting Luz's privacy. She chooses to respect Luz's privacy in the end, but confronts Luz about what happened and makes it clear that it's okay to give people time until they're ready to talk about stuff. And I love that. I can't think of much wrong with this episode. It serves as a great starting point for the rest of the season after such a long hiatus, while not devolving into an episode that's just about set up. I think it's great that the writing is reaching these levels, especially since the show has finally figured out subtle storytelling. From here on out, Al has us going full steam ahead with the story content, there is no filler in sight. Episode 12 is about- oh, 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 okay, let's not get personal! It's about Luz desiring more information about Philip Witterbane, the author of the book she found in the library. To do this, her and Lilith get involved with... Time travel! My favourite narrative device, I want to kill myself! Look, I'm not even gonna get into the time travel debate, it is an argument as old as time itself, funnily enough. So the fact that it at least follows the same rules and principles as every other time travel story that at least acknowledges the temporal paradox is appreciated, and I'm happy it doesn't get more complicated than that. The episode revolves around Luz and Lilith meeting Philip during the Dead Wardian era of the Boiling Isles as he searches for a being known as the Collector, teaching him certain things along the way and generally assisting him in obtaining a stone that the Collector is trapped inside, only to realise that Philip is just an asshole, who will literally do anything and use anyone to get what he wants as he offers Lilith and Luz as bait so he can steal without issue. Obviously, this doesn't go too well. Ah, you hateable sorceress! Stay mad. Literally just told him to cope and see if I unironically stan. At the end, it's revealed that Philip was indeed Bellos. Something that I would have called in my first season 2 review if I hadn't forgotten. This YouTube thing is so gosh darn easy, I don't know what all the fuss is about. I appreciate that the episode is centred on the past as a concept rather than strictly time travel, as we get to see Ida's fear over hurting her father years ago in her Albeast form, refusing to talk to him or to face that memory again. It's a part of her past she wants to forget and run away from, and I love that while her father says the obvious let the past stay in the past, it feels genuine. One thing I definitely appreciate this season is how realistically written the conversations the adults have between themselves is, and we're gonna see more of that as we continue, but when the show's fantasy stuff finally takes a back seat and the characters just talk to each other, it's refreshingly down to earth. Showing their history, their trauma, and how much they love each other, it's fantastic stuff. There's a lot you can do with a show's lore and story writing that can be impressive, but scaled down conversations can be just as, if not more compelling. The show in general is getting much better at showing how much its characters have developed without them being at the centre of entire episodes. Lilith recognising how Philip is saying what her and Luz wants to hear, especially after he compliments her upon sensing her suspicion, making it clear that there's something uncomfortable and familiar about his manipulation, was a natural progression of how she's been written thus far, being able to recognise when she's being manipulated and having the agency to warn Luz that Philip might not be trustworthy. Just watching her build up her confidence throughout the episode from literally saying, Am I broken? All the way to Stay mad. Does her so much justice. Gotta also appreciate how Ida's mom and dad just accept her adoption of King into her family, being happy over the prospect of having a grandson. I love how this show allows so many kinds of people to feel seen and represented without it coming off as hastily included for extra credit. I still don't think Lumity was paced all too well in season one, but season two's relationships, both platonic and romantic, are included in the narrative so much better, and it's great that they've struck a good balance between exploring these relationships and letting the plot progress. Other than that, though, you can definitely feel in this episode how the story is being rushed. Now it's still a solid episode, not gonna lie, but I always got the feeling like it was a bit too early to pull the curtains on Philip, or even reveal that he was Bellos. It was a necessary thing for them to do to be able to finish their story, but in an ideal world, I would have liked if Philip's journal was shown to us a bit more before revealing that he's a self-centered, prejudiced asswipe. I'm not sure what to feel about him being revealed as Bellos in this episode. On one hand, it's kinda just casually shown to us, and I think if we saw more of Philip beforehand, it would have worked better, but on the other hand, it's 
sort of works under the idea of it building suspense as the characters figure it out later, just throwing in some old school dramatic irony. Shock is a powerful tool and suspense can be even better, but for Bellos I personally would have gone the shocking route. Very good episode though. Also Snorses. She goofed off riding wild snake horses and- Snorses. Wait, what's this? Willow is getting her own episode? What? Huh? You mean you'll finally get me to care about Willow? Psych it, Hunter. I am once again apologizing to Willow fans, but I just do not find Willow that interesting. She is far and away the most shafted character in the main cast, and it pains me how underdeveloped she really is. I'm not saying she's had no development, but I'd really like just one episode where she's the main focus. Hell, Gus has gotten two of those this season, and that was enough for me to finally show some appreciation for the little guy. Anyway, good thing this is still a really good Hunter episode. Hunter clearly has a very warped perception of the world and how the general public view stuff like admiration, respect, friendship, and how all those things are earned. He's been shut up by the Emperor's Covenant into believing that all the things he does is right and justified, and if it wasn't for his encounters with Luz and Amity, he most likely would have not found himself on the right path after all this time. One of Hunter's most insightful lines in this episode was his remark towards the Coven leaders and his own idea of what friendship is. Friends don't stab each other in the back. Sure they do. The Coven heads do it all the time back at the castle. Hunter has never had a positive role model or influence before. It explains so much about his worldview and why he goes through with stuff like indoctrinating kids from Hexide without questioning the ethics of it. The only thing he questions is if it would make him worthy of being the Golden Guard. Hunter has so many lines in season 2 about his own purpose and questioning how much he means to people, what he has to do to earn respect and admiration, what he has to do to please Bellos, to be worthy, to be someone's friend. He, like Willow, since she's an integral part of the episode 2, struggles with the idea of earning respect, having their talents and existence feeling validated, but both coming from completely different backgrounds under two completely different scenarios. As salty as I am that this wasn't a Willow episode, Willow was absolutely the right call for this, and seeing them make that connection between the two was sweet. Maybe a little too sweet, oh wait, oh fuck, go back! This episode is an important part in Hunter's journey, allowing him to make real friends outside of the Emperor's Coven, playing sports with people and even being incredibly good at it. While he at first does it to try and recruit Willow, Gus, and their friends, you can see him lose that evil part of himself when he plays. For a brief moment, the Golden Guard didn't exist and it was just Hunter. It's why towards the end of the episode he argues with himself over if he is really worthy of being the Golden Guard. After sending innocent kids to the Emperor, and hearing that their palisman will also be taken, especially knowing why Bellus needs them, is the extra nudge he needs to do the right thing. And I'm happy that after all was said and done, he's forgiven. His position and reasoning being understood in the long run. Darius also caught me completely off guard since his only real accomplishment as a character before was capturing Rain, and now he's suddenly a genuinely positive influence for Hunter, sending him out on this mission so he could try and make connections outside of the castle, and even admiring his willingness to sacrifice his status and take a punishment for letting the kids go. For what's probably the first time ever, Hunter is praised and rewarded for doing the right thing, and on top of it, ends the day having made new friends. This episode also lets us know that Darius isn't as bad as he let on when he captured Rain, and serves as a good way to make later events make a bit more sense. I'm loving the more character-driven episode this season. Season 1 had a lot of episodes that were mainly more concerned with the episode concepts, and they had varying degrees of success. Looking back on the body swap episode, it's so evident they just threw it in because they could. So I'm incredibly thankful season 2 is going in a much more welcome direction with building up the characters, leaving extra breadcrumbs to assist the narrative, and then having it culminate in an important episode. Much more structural, a lot cleaner, and allows me to appreciate how real the characters feel. We've come a long way since the days of- And I practice the ancient art of fiction. <laughs> Nothing prepared me for where this episode's ending was gonna go, and I was not expecting something so somber and touching. The episode leaves you in a constant state of concern for Luz over what she's trying to avoid, thinking about, when she sees a reminder on her phone. We already know it's something she has to do with her mom, so we can understand that part, but we're constantly aligned with Ida, King, and Amity throughout the episode as we grow more and more concerned as Luz gets more and more erratic, starting with her taking on a massive load of activities she can't possibly hope to complete in one single day, finding anything or any reason to keep her talking or to distract herself from the nagging reminder in the back of her head, actively running away from the problem. And when it comes to the tournament Amity wants in on to impress her dad, loses overjoyed to help her but gradually becomes far more overactive, causing her to lie to Amity which sabotages her fights. If you've noticed before how Luz will tend to project her problems and assist people who are suffering with similar issues, you may have already connected the dots and concluded that it has something to do with her father. Amity finally presses her on what's happening and we're given the revelation that it's the anniversary of her dad passing 
passing away. And today, she was supposed to go out and pick flowers with Camila, explaining that while she's not using it as an excuse for what she did, it's why she wanted to help Amity with her own daddy issues. The episode goes into both of these issues, but doesn't hold one up on a pedestal in comparison. They're both tackled with respect, care, and while Luz's seems more tragic, it doesn't undermine Amity's problems. It further highlights how nice but self-destructive Luz's behaviour is, running away from her trauma and solving other problems to try and escape from it, especially when those same problems can help others who have similar issues. It's why she helped Kikimura and refused to tell Amity or anyone else about meeting her mom in the human realm, and it's also why she helped Amity and, again, refused to tell anyone about her own problems. Furthermore, it's great that the episode recognises that just because something happened a long time ago doesn't mean it's unreasonable for you to feel sad. Obviously some are going to relate to this more than others, but feeling sad about something isn't something to be ashamed of. Moving on is important, but you shouldn't ever forget. You shouldn't ever run from your problems, and you don't have to keep it to yourself. Not letting this stuff get to you can be a positive, but shutting yourself off entirely can be a massive detriment to your own well-being, and it's important to share those feelings if you're comfortable doing so. The lighting and backgrounds in this episode were also absolutely stunning. It captures the tone and beauty of this scene perfectly, and the voice acting and dialogue are stellar. Like, even when Luz is coming back to help after talking with Amity, you can still hear in her voice that she's still going through some stuff. They haven't just forgotten about it. I can handle this. Thank you for listening. I can't wait to pick flowers with you. I also love the connection between Amity and her father, how Alador is clearly a lot more distant towards his kids than Odalia is, but not on the same level of controlling and seems to do his fair share of it out of genuine care for Amity rather than just having her on a material level like Odalia. The fact that he and Amity got to share a brief moment between each other too sets him even further apart from his wife. While he isn't entirely trustworthy right now, it's great that he's being set up and written this way in advance, and it provides a lot more layers to Amity's family relations. This was a fantastic character-focused episode, and I'm super glad that the show allows its emotional moments to breathe. There's, ironically, a clear human touch to these scenes, and it helps the pacing a lot, which is famously a massive problem with the show's writing that this half of season 2 has managed to avoid. I was already invested in the Owl House at this point, but this episode is what officially made me love the show. It's willing to tackle such common issues for kids and adults while perfectly attributing them to the show's characters, and how their relationships play out. It's willing to break away from the noisy and hectic world of the Boiling Isles to give moments of reflection, sorrow, but also a lot of heart, never letting it devolve into doom and gloom unless it's of great importance to the narrative like with the finale, and this wasn't even the season's best. Alright, so the way I phrased that suggested that this episode was the season's best. It's not. I, I woke up at 6am to write the script, leave me alone. I'm starting to think I wasn't very good at my job. Anyway, I don't have too much to say for this episode other than it's cute. If you search for the word smug in the dictionary, you're just gonna find an image of young Ida. This little gremlin is such an aura of pretentiousness, is like the cause of singularity. And I love it. This is really shocking. I thought there'd be more. Protect that smile. Wars will be fought to protect this smile. Oh, for fuck's sake. I loved how they foreshadowed how Rain would be resisting Terra's control during the flashback. It's interesting how certain types of magic are used in the show, and I love how flexible something like barred magic is. I would have loved to get a lot more insight into the advanced ways magic could be used in the show, so they could probably do that in the future, or wait, it's a Disney show, get fucked. What else? Uh, I like how Terra's game quite literally represents the system othering Ida and Rain, separating them based on status and then pitting them against each other. That was cool. Uh, this scene. This is a stress toy. Anytime you feel the urge to cause chaos, just squeeze. Uh, bumps a twink in this episode. It's not that the episode is filler, it's just that it's mostly a fun little adventure that provides some character context and at the end hints at the continuing efforts of Rain's rebellion, what Bellows has planned, and at all this time, Rain just wants to keep Ida safe and out of harm's way. It's a sweet episode and the fandom gets a bunch of free profile pictures. Everyone wins. Uh, this episode, no one wins. Everyone is traumatized. This is surprisingly on brand for Disney. I don't know what all the fuss is about. Hollow Mind was so hollow mind blowingly good, it hollow reminded me that my soul isn't so hollow mind and that there's space for my love of the show and my hollow mind. Every square inch of this episode tells a story that is both sort of expected yet dreadful and terrifying, doubling down on just how much of a bastard Bellos truly is, juxtaposing his art museum of lies he constructed surrounding his ruling of the deep dark forest of his true memories, displaying how he rose to power for the manipulation 
manipulation and separation of the public through the implementation of the Coven system, giving us more hints as to what the Day of Unity truly is and going into some incredibly dark territory. Dark territory as in casually almost killing an entire village of people he uses test subjects for sigils, displaying paintings in the background of how he betrayed and murdered his brother, and showing the decaying masks of the previous Golden Guards and revealing to Hunter directly that he is a Grimwalker, a clone, presumably of his brother that he murdered many years ago, ending with him revealing his true identity to Luz, causing her to blame herself for assisting him all those years ago, and completely annihilating any form of hope she has, as the one human other than herself that she used to look up to has been the monster she's been up against this entire time. Part of me is wondering how Luz didn't piece this together herself, but it makes sense knowing how she always tried to see the goodness of best parts of people, and was just simply in denial at the prospect. Who knows how much she helped Bellos do by teaching him that light glyph, all the things he could have discovered with its usage, all the while Bellos mentally torments her, nudging her on to calling him by his real name and acknowledging what she's done. Bellos always remembered her, even when they supposedly first met in season 1, and this was his time to get revenge, and he's clearly savouring it as much as he can. This episode shows just how despicable and borderline disturbing Bellos is. The entire scene with Luz is incredibly uncomfortable, and the paintings, I mean, they further assist his status as a witch hunter. He was born during a period of humanity where witches were feared and despised. Upon entering this new world with his brother, he was dismayed to find that he had been charmed by the idea of learning witchcraft and had fallen for another witch. Instead of simply being hurt and moved on, Bellos attacked and supposedly killed his brother, and after all this time, centuries later, he hasn't moved on from his biases. He's had ample time to do so, but his hatred for witches is deep-rooted. He's fighting for a cause to end witch kind and to protect humanity, unaware of the time that has passed and how society has progressed in the human realm. His ideals and hatred are outdated as the world moves on without him. I appreciate the poignancy. Hunter's entire world comes crashing down in this episode. He has his doubts about Bellos, but he's the only figure in his life he's ever looked up to, and he can't be convinced to let go so easily. Making excuses, wallowing in his denial, it's only when he stumbles across the mask of the previous guards that everything breaks, and upon asking questions, he's officially lost his usefulness to Bellos. All of the guards knew the truth in the end, and considering how the Grimwalkers were all cloned from Bellos' brother, it puts everything about Hunter's life into perspective. And what about Hunter, what's a Grimwalker? He's a better version of an old friend. There's a lot to interpret about this, but I see it as this. Bellos has always sought to recreate his brother, one who follows his path. And yet every time, whenever the Grimwalkers begin asking questions, he snuffs them out and makes a new one. It's a sick, twisted dynamic. And Bellos's calm demeanor as he explains all of this to Luz is chilling. I know I jokingly said Matthew Reese lied about Bellos earlier on, but god, his performance as Bellos is fantastic. Upon exiting Bellos's mind, Hunter loses it. Everything that has just happened rushes around his head causing him to undergo a panic attack, and he leaves throwing away his cape, finally relieving himself of his Golden Guard identity, while Luz stands there having lost all hope. This episode's atmosphere, its tension, and the way it leads up to its reveal is phenomenal. Even elements like the monster Bellos that appears in his mind being a manifestation of the palisman he's consumed over the centuries adds to the subtle horror present in this episode. There's a lot of content here that's incredibly off-putting, and it's stuff that I'm genuinely surprised they got away with. Outside of Bellos' mind though, the beginning of the episode tells us that people are giving in to Bellos' rule. The Emperor's grasp on the Isles has grown much tighter and it feels a lot more oppressive. I mean, King literally says this. No one wants to think they've wasted their life following the wrong person. We just gotta find something big to change their minds. Which is a very obvious bit of commentary, but also telegraphs Hunter's denial when viewing Bellus's memories, which is a nice double meaning. Not giving much attention to Rain, Darius, and the rejected Thundercats OC as they work together, but their inclusion was great. Ida keeping her cool in a state of panic, telling King and Hootie to not crowd, lose, and Hunter, and even telling Hunter to breathe before he panics. This is great character writing for her, displaying her obvious concern for Luz, but also concern for Hunter despite not being on the best terms with him. Really great interaction. Oh, and I can't just end this section without talking about the Collector. Supposedly a child from the stars who was entrapped by a titan centuries ago, holding incredible knowledge and power as evidenced by the fact that he gave Bellos a draining spell, but has the mentality and playful mood of a kid, wanting to cause chaos, destruction, and death because it's a fun game to him. The vocal performance lets that disturbing childlike innocence thrive. I'm starting to think you make those things just to destroy them. You have fun with it. Admit 
it! <laughs> And his shadowy design is really cool. It's clear from the get-go that the Collector doesn't have so much as an opposite agenda to Belos, but isn't all too concerned with Belos' ideals and is simply doing this so he could be freed, being allowed to have all the fun he wants without issue. Giving a little kid godlike powers of horrifying skill only for him to use them for fun in games, not even really aware that he's being evil, is a nice change of pace and juxtaposes Belos' layered and meaningful ideals. The Collector just wants to play games, and it seems that he has a lot of fun breaking his toys. We can likely infer that Belos won't be holding up his end of the deal with how easy it is to manipulate a literal child. And while I wish we saw more of him before the show's final stretch, his inclusion is 100% welcome. I can't think of much that's wrong with this episode, it hits each mark perfectly and changes so much about the series. I may be pretty biased towards Edith's Requiem, but this is easily one of the show's best episodes. Plot progression is officially being kicked into high gear now, and damn, can I just say, Alex Hirsch is absolutely precious as king. He shows so much emotion in this one episode from his giddy excitement, hesitation, confusion, and above all, heartbreak. The scene at the end is King gently waves to the titan, letting out an incredibly quiet, um, hi, before going silent once more, such a small but powerful little moment. Oh yeah, uh, King's a titan. <laughs> Yeah, some people figured it out, but I didn't because I have a life. But this does change a lot of things, especially when thinking about season 3. The episode follows up on Luz's shattered state of mind following the previous episode, where we once again see her abridged memory of what the Collector said to Bellos. This time it doesn't really mean all that much given the Collector was still talking about the genocide of witches, but Luz definitely remembers it sounding a lot more sinister given she wasn't able to talk about what had happened until the next day as she gathered her thoughts. I hope they address this stuff in season 3 because it's a really cool narrative device and it gives me a lot to think about. And again with the down-to-earth conversations, either keeping her composure but standing her ground at the idea of losing King going out when the Emperor is looking for them, then finally breaking down once losing King have left, I mean, it's great. Not great that she's crying, we're just watching her and Lilith have an adult conversation, acknowledging that losing King are children and that they shouldn't have to go through this. You see plenty of story-driven shows with child protags and you never really get any examples of the trauma they've experienced being acknowledged or handled properly. I mean, maybe Steven Universe, but I think most can agree that that wasn't executed perfectly. Cough cough. The Titan Trappers were cool and some of the artwork here is fantastic. I like their connection to the Collector, although this is definitely something that would have been explored more of enough time. Also, Hollow Mind got me thinking so much about two-dimensional chaos gods and Disney shows that the second they said Bill in this episode I nearly had a fucking conniption. But nah, it's just some crazy guy. No connections here. Wait, Stan canonically married Ida, didn't he? King's reaction to him being a titan was gut-wrenching, believing he had finally found people who were just like him, who, upon finding this out, planned to have him killed. Having this come after the scene where he excitedly but hesitantly asks to play catch, seeing Tarak as the father he wished he always had, the realization that he's been living on one of his own kind for so long, and is teary-eyed. I wanna go home. God, it's too good. However, while I do appreciate that the show has kicked its story content into high gear, it's evident that they are rushing. I mean, the pacing is fine for the most part, no issues there. It's fast paced but doesn't skim over details, but it's again an unfortunate consequence of the show's cancellation. So the fact that they even did this and had it turn out as good as it was is phenomenal. This season is setting itself as a brilliant example of how to wrap up your show under the worst circumstances and I am 100% here for it. Finally, a Gus episode, and Hunter? Well, let's see how that goes. What the hell, that was strangely compelling, how do you keep doing this, Dana? Alright, petty critiques out of the way first. This episode feels like three episodes rolled into one, and the pacing is kinda bad. The episode clearly doesn't have its shit together entirely, the structuring is an absolute mess, you can pinpoint several points of the episode that feel like different ideas thrown into one, and I respect the resourcefulness because it certainly worked out in the end, but it's very messy. Gus meeting Willow at the start was a bit too quick, and I think it deserved its own episode just to explore that relationship. Would have also been a good opportunity to let Willow have some meaningful screen time and develop alongside Gus. Willow and Abity's subplot was very underdeveloped and gets brushed aside in the third act, and that's it, I think. With all of that out of the way, the fact that this episode is still good is frankly a miracle. Willow teaching Gus the breathing exercise and having that willingness to share it with him during his illusion projection panic attack state was really sweet, and seeing him share it with Hunter rounds it all out. I'm glad these two can finally see eye to eye, and at the end of the episode where Hunter tries to relay the breathing exercise, it, it was cute, you know? But it's also appreciated that Gus knows he didn't get it right and it's 
just happy there's someone there to listen to him instead of belittling him for being unhappy or stressed out. Even when breathing doesn't work, just reaching out to someone under stress and listening to them can go a long way. I like that they're exploring intricate subjects like this with such precision. There's a lot of that this season that I was able to relate to, so thanks guys, it means a lot. Gus's gigantic illusion being caused by his own anxiety and stress, lamenting over him being constantly tricked and taken advantage of, gives him a lot more needed depth. I'm a little iffy about just how powerful his magic is, but I'm willing to let it slide since it doesn't outright ruin the episode. They had to rush things, and it's clearly caused by an emotional outburst and wasn't a controlled attack. I'm willing to suspend my disbelief of illusion magic, specifically getting more powerful through massive, uncontrollable swings of emotion. Hunter was fantastic as usual. I love that the only place he fought to go was Hexide, seeing as he has fond memories with Willow and her team. What the hell is that? I just love the scene where Gus gets him to cool down during his panic attack and he's been spotted by the Emperor's coven. Bellos is clearly looking for him and his capture would mean a certain death. Having someone he can finally console with and talk to was very heartwarming. The show has just about mastered believable character interactions. The dialogue is so, so, so good at conveying the deepest of their emotions and the voice acting is brilliant. I don't have much else to add other than Willow and Amity's subplot being appreciated but very shallow and rushed. It's just them learning to get along a little better and not needing one to rely on the other, while establishing that Amity is just being protective and isn't doing any of this with a feeling of superiority. I loved how it was resolved in the last fight scene, but it was a clear victim of the episode's lack of time and I think it would have benefited the episode if it was left out. We already know their bond is on the men, so stuffing more into an already overstuffed episode seems a bit overkill. Still, this was a damn good episode and one that I could definitely relate to. It's a messy but surprisingly thoughtful story and I'm glad it was able to be told. Alright, we're officially approaching endgame territory here and it absolutely feels like it. The build up to the day of unity is delightfully dreadful and intense. The tone is far more oppressive and dark, still allowing for moments of levity, but the severity and seriousness of the current situation cannot be ignored. This is it, the make or break of Luz's journey. So Steve was cool. I like Steve. Steve's nice. King finally having the power and authority that comes with being a titan, but not being sure that he wants it through the fear of being treated differently was a nice thing to address. King's always been everyone's little tyrant, but now he has power and authority, able to command others to do his bidding if he wants them. This is something he really doesn't want, and it's made it all the more clear when Lilith begins geeking out over him being a titan and starts treating him with this holier-than-vow attitude. It leads to him going soul-searching around the titan with Steve of all characters, and it's a really nice and sweet way to go about it. I never I thought one of the most developed characters for this season would be King, but I'm once again majorly impressed. His connection to the Collector is also established here, going to sleep and ending up in the same dimension Luz found herself in when she tried to use the makeshift portal door. I hope this gets explained more in the future, but for now it's a pretty cool way of showing how they're both connected. It was Luz and Ida's arc that made the episode for me though. First of all, this joke. Beach day? Maybe if we had time for 20 more adventures, but we don't. But also at how the obligatory fight between the two feels like a natural progression. Luz of course wants to help even if it puts her in harm's way, and Ida wants to help but keep Luz safe. She wants to leave Luz no indication of where they were after the Owl House was ransacked, but Lilith just so happened to leave a note with their location. Ida cares deeply for Luz after two seasons of sticking with her and building their bond together. Ida is basically a second mother to Luz at this point. She doesn't want to tell Luz that there's no plan or that there's no hope of left of defeating Bella. She wants to give her kids one last day before everything goes to shit. Hell, that beach day line isn't just a jab at Disney. It shows her hesitance to bring Luz anywhere near the Emperor's Coven even if she wants to pull off a heist there on her last day. Ida also meets Rain again, who we now know is putting on an act, pretending to have her memories wiped, just to keep Ida out of harm's way, and yet Ida continues to do so. Both Ida and Luz have figures in their life that love them dearly but are always trying to protect them through the, even the most desperate of measures, despite their tenacity, and this is lost on Ida for the longest time. When Luz finds out Ida could be sending her away from the danger, it all reaches a boiling point and they fight, leading to their capture where they both break down simultaneously. The Owl House is so ridiculously good at flushing out relationships, not necessarily starting them, which can often have mixed results, but over time, every relationship in the show, whether friendship or romantic, blooms into something special and real. These characters go through such intense situations, dealing with their own trauma, responsibilities, and their desire to keep people close to them safe, and I'm immensely happy they found just the right amount of time to write all of this instead of going full blast with the story. Thankfully, everything is fine, as we finally get to see Rain's rebellion in full, ending with Luz and Ida finally carving Luz's palisman, creating one final nice memory before the day of unity. As always, the animation and vocal work is fantastic, and the show is gearing up towards an explosive ending that's about to defy basically all the odds. 
These are the last two episodes are basically a two-parter, so I wanted to bunch them up together instead of talking about them individually, as holy shit, the Owl House finally had a great season finale. Well, there's a few problems here, but compared to season one, this is a monumental improvement. Right off the bat, you can see the divide between the Collector and Bellos begin to grow as he continually taunts Bellos and pokes holes in his plan about how humanity could have changed since he last visited, and mocking him for not being able to keep its human shape due to the growing monster inside of him. You know for a fact that Bellos is going to betray the Collector. It's not trying to be some big twist, it's just further evidence that Bellos is a horrible person and won't hold up his end of the deal. I don't know if we're supposed to feel conflicted about the Collector, but you can definitely feel sorry for him. He's just a kid and all he wants is freedom, even if his powers are terrifyingly, well, powerful. Beyond that, I love that Luth carved her palisman into an egg so that it has the freedom to choose its own identity. I love that she didn't just rush right into making one for the sake of having power right then and there, and treats it with compassion and care. This fits wonderfully with her arc and it's incredibly sweet. The first act of episode 20 sort of just lets you take in how far these characters and by extension, how far the show has come since its first season. Not talking quality wise, but just the journey itself. You're always going to have a point in a story driven show where it's fun to look back on all of the episodic light hearted episodes as the story delves into darker territory. The outcome is uncertain, and the lead up to the Day of Unity is legitimately harrowing. As for the characters, Ida, King, and Lou sharing one last goodbye was just plain cruel. Lou stressing to rain to protect Ida under the most dire circumstances was needed. The rest of the episode mainly follows Lou and her friends rescuing Amity and trying to put a stop to Blight Industries as they assist the Emperor. Hey Disney, I hope you're enjoying your China stocks. Hey, what's this? Alador finally gets the development that he needed, although it is definitely rushed into the story, but it's nice hearing that he wants to take care of his kids and that a lot of the bad things he's done have largely been due to Odelia's control. Also placing him in poor working conditions, someone unionize the Blight family please. Anyway, Odalia makes an even worse impression than she did previously by- Don't you talk to my girlfriend like that! Girlfriend? Oh no no, that won't do. Immediately making an enemy of every Lumity Stern. I'd say God help you, but you have shown up twice, so wait, 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 you've shown up twice? Yeah, a lot of this episode would have been a lot more impactful if Adalia was actually shown more in advance. Like, even having one extra episode with her in it would have helped. She's still an uptight, unlikable bitch, and no amount of first thing for the community will change my mind, especially since she knows that the Day of Unity is basically genocide and was willingly giving Bellos an army anyway, but still, she needed way more screen time. Amity's parents are admittedly underdeveloped and I'm glad that Alador at least got to redeem himself. I also like the attention to detail here with Hunter disguised as Luz doing his flashy things so that when Luz disguised as Hunter is later captured it actually makes a lot more sense. The animation in this episode was great all around, most of the time, and does a great job at setting up the final episode. Speaking of which, everything happens so fast here. Kinda like Youngblood Old Souls but it clearly has its shit together in spite of all the odds, and I'm forever going to be impressed by just how good this finale was. The emotions are at an all-time high and so are the stakes. We know what the Day of Unity is going to do, but seeing the slow, gradual deaths of thousands of people, including characters we know like Ida and Rain, is soul-crushing after seeing them go through so much this season. Rain letting Ida know that they promised to protect her, ripping off her arm that's been marked by a sigil just so she could be spared, but leaving their own fate uncertain. Luz and Bellos' bargaining scene was really well done. Wait, no, stop, 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 I don't want to go back! Watching Luz finally gain the upper hand on Bellos was incredibly satisfying, and this monster form is still just as disturbing as it was in Hollow Mind. I like that even during this massive fight scene, they still managed to give us info about Bellis in his past. Gus puts him under a spell where the paintings of him and his brother flash on by, and when Hunter steps in to save Gus, he goes to him and forms his real face to try and manipulate him once more, only to notice Hunter's palisman and shouts, which is most likely his brother's name. Eventually, King gets the idea to free the Collector to get him to stop the draining spell. I think it's this scene that makes it clear how the Collector isn't really evil. He's sadistic for sure, but at heart, he's just a kid. Same mannerisms, same amount of patience, and doesn't seem to be hiding an ulterior motive, revealing that it was actually King's father who trapped him in the stone. The connection between Titans and the Collector is something I definitely want to see more of in Season 3, if they even have time for it. King frees the Collector under the condition that he plays the Owl House game, with him, which we have no idea what that is, but given the ending, there's only so much we can theorize about that. So the Collector kills Bellos and then proceeds to- Wait, hold on a fucking second! I mean, okay, that was certainly a choice. I mean, he's clearly not dead. The credits make that abundantly clear, but Jesus, this came out of nowhere, and I- 
kind of like it. Hey, 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 now, I would have loved for Bellows to still be the main threat for season three. He is a fantastic villain, finally worthy of this show, with so much intriguing history that we've only gotten a glimpse of so far. But I won't lie that having him be villainous in the background while the Collector takes the spot as the main threat is an idea that has some potential. Again, the whole idea is that he's a kid with godlike powers. The threat is that there is no established threat. It's pure childlike chaos as he plays a game we have no details of. He's not as fleshed out as Bellos, but the Collector is still an interesting villain because he's not even evil. Bellos knows that the acts he is carrying out are immoral, but believes that he's ultimately doing the right thing. The Collector is just a warped kid who now has a massive toy box to play with. There are so many ways this could go, and I'll admit, having him immediately delete Bellows from physical form and moving the moon with his finger established how much of an unsettling threat he really is, because you can't read him or any of what he wants to do. And while this probably would have worked out better with more time, the fact that it works at all and is still an impactful way to end things is astounding. Luz keeps the portal to Earth open for everyone and vows to stay behind to help Ida, but King takes the fall instead, tearfully wishing her goodbye before pushing her through the portal back to Earth, with no way of returning. No! 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 Okay, is there a therapy coven? Cause, uh, season 2B was out of this world in terms of how better it was compared to everything that came before. The Owl House has become a heavily character-focused show, weaving personal stories of trauma and relationships together with perfectly written dialogue, giving each heartbreaking moment a chance to breathe, to let itself go, and to give these characters the depth that they need, and in some cases require. You could have the most perfect, grandiose story imaginable, but if you have no compelling characters to populate it, then its impact really wouldn't be felt. But Owl House recognizes its lack of time, and chooses to try and implement the best of both worlds with varying but still high levels of success. My thoughts on the show have been as turbulent as its production, but I'm a proud fan now. I have so much respect for this team for pushing straight through Disney's corporate nonsense and telling the best story they can, and it's a relief that the story they told, while not exactly the one they wanted, ended up being a great one. This is one of Disney's best modern cartoons, hands down. I have nothing but faith in the crew to deliver a season 3 that's satisfying. To think that season 1 was mostly enjoyable but still relatively safe. Just look at the show now. Darker, far more mature, bursting at the seams with lore and character depth. That stuff doesn't inherently make a show good, but it's the execution that matters. The show's not perfect. The pacing can be dodgy at times, the episode structure can be messy, and some characters get shafted in favour of others. Yet it's still great. I'm repeating myself at this point, but if you've watched this video without seeing the show, I highly recommend that you watch it yourself, even if you know what's going to happen. I can't possibly do this show justice in a few words in a YouTube video, so just go ahead and watch it. Alright, now for some extra thoughts before we wrap things up. Season 3 needs to provide more of an explanation for what the Collector is and where he came from. We need substantially more information about him as opposed to what Kikimura said to King. In fact, Season 3 needs to juggle a lot to provide a climax that at least concludes the current story arc. I have faith that they will since they have two hours to get this done, but it's still valid to have concerns even when you're excited. As for 2B as a whole, Lumity went from being debatably rushed to being a textbook example of how to write an LGBT relationship in a cartoon. Their chemistry is charming and the writers treat the relationship like any other. Same goes to Rain and Ida. I love that the show allows so many different people to feel seen and validated without its coming off as forced. It feels meaningfully written. The voice acting this season was also killer. Everyone got their chance to shine, from Matthew Reese's Bellows portraying a soft-spoken, unsettlingly calm dictator-manipulator with a warped perception of the world around him, to Alex Hirsch as King, selling King's childlike enthusiasm and excitement while absolutely nailing his tiny voice cracks when he gets emotional. Everyone involved deserves props, absolutely fantastic work. The animation and artwork was great all around, developing such intense, beautiful atmospheres that complement that specific episode. The music was also really good. I remember not thinking much of Owl House's soundtrack, but there was a lot of fantastic tracks here, especially the Collector's theme. Even though a lot of theories were confirmed this season, it managed to actually subvert expectations pretty well. Not in any sort of pretentious way either. It provided surprises, but the surprises still made sense for the story. That's how it should work. The only time I thought it was a bit iffy was Bellows getting game ended in half a second, but I can safely say I didn't know what to expect from a lot of this season and came out pleasantly surprised. While this show has a long way to go and a very hard task ahead of it, I'm sure that it'll eventually come out the other end in one piece. If not, then sure, prep your distant A12 comments in advance. But for what it's worth, there hasn't been a show I've loved this much in ages. I love these characters, I love watching them talk to each other about their problems, solving them together, and sticking together through the adversities that get thrown their way. It isn't the most well-rounded show ever, or masterpiece, or anywhere close to perfect. 
but Owl House is incredible now for what it sets out to do, what it manages to do, and everything it accomplishes in spite of its current predicament, and I'm anxiously but positively waiting for more.